OK. So today we're, gonna, uh, we're going to spend you know, just one class period talking about teams and managing teams. And um, you all have experience in this area, both this semester and in previous. So tell me about a time you were put on a team. Yeah, Josh. Ah, uh, the finance team. Okay, so the Proclaim group, right? You you have a pretty clear team, the finance team. What else? What else have you ever done that as it relates to being on a team? Josh. <laughs> <laughs> well, sports team. Okay, I mean, who has an athletic background at at all? Oh wow. Okay. I. Didn't know it was that many. Um, so, I mean, there are definitely components, a lot of components, that transfer from athletic teams into work based teams. It doesn't always translate perfectly, but a lot of things you've learned in a sports team, it, it still works um, whenever you take that into the workplace. That's a possibility. Anyone um, outside of NEOs or outside of a sports team? Can you think of a time you've been a part of a team? Yeah, can I was part of the uh, marketing team at the Fastwood South Box. The marketing team. Okay, and how many people were on your team? Uh, nine people. Nine. And what did you do? So, well, I originally started out as just like a marketing specialist, and then I was promoted yeah. to the head of customer service. So, but what did the team do? Or how did you use the word team? I mean, we just we used visual communications to um, communicate effectively like what we were looking to establish through the fact that we're about lots to communicate people's um, stories and testimony and stuff like that. Okay. We use social media a lot. Okay. All right. What else? Yeah. Sorry. I've been on a couple of project teams just because I think it's like kind yeah. of a hodgepodge of people that may not have met and you're only with them for like a month or two. Oh, really? Okay. Just to complete a project, okay? Like a project team. Okay, um, well listen, if nothing else, right, you all have experience with what's currently going on because we are utilizing some components of what we're talking about here when we talk about managing teams. Big picture, right, coming off of last chapter, um, we talked about a little bit about departmentalization and last time we talked a little bit about this idea of specialization. So in a, uh, from a grander context, right, Part of the reason that workforces are using teams so much is because we started to see the downsides of being highly specialized in our particular area. Now, that doesn't mean specialization when it comes to job design has gone away. It just means that we've figured out at some point in time that utilizing teams can be really advantageous. And so you see a lot of it right in today's workforce. Okay. So a work team, just to put a definition behind it, it's a small number of people with complementary skills who hold themselves mutually accountable for pursuing a common purpose, uh, achieving performance goals, and improving interdependent work processes. So we're going to go through some advantages of teams, right? disadvantages of teams, some characteristics of teams, um, how teams cycle through their various phases. It's a pretty normal thing. Um, I mentioned already, but you know, if you look at and again, this isn't a perfect statistic, but about 90% of employers utilize work teams in some way, shape, or form. Um, so overwhelmingly, you're probably, when you go out into the workforce, you're probably going to experience this in some way. So it, it's pretty applicable. And you know, as you know with NEOS, we're, we're also doing it there too. Okay, so I'll ask you for more, right? But one of the advantages that people, um, at least uh, I think perceive, sometimes assume, is that part of the reason we're using teams is that we have a greater sum total of knowledge and information with whenever we bring more people into a project or into a service or whatever we're doing. All right, so why else do you think we use teams? Like what else do you think uh, might be some advantages to using teams? Yeah, John. Greater efficiency, okay? I mean, that's a good managerial word there, Josh. It's good. Um, do you think we use teams for greater um, 
it's for both, right? But do you think at the onset we start to use teams for efficiency or effectiveness? Yeah, Nicole. Probably effectiveness because you can combine all the different abilities and like skill sets to get okay. easier production. All right. Yeah, I mean, usually, right, we, we usually start to use teams with the idea of being effective in, in mind. Now, that's not to say efficiency can't come later at some point. But as we'll learn, um, one of the downsides of teams could be that that doesn't happen like on day one, right, when you start to use teams. So, but you mentioned a couple of other things, right? Uh, you just mentioned a couple of things like, um, hey, we have different ways that we approach problem solving. And that can be an advantage of using teams, right? We all have different past experiences. So that can be an advantage of having people come together in a workforce, in a team-based workforce. Whoops. Um, OK, so another advantage I just mentioned, greater number of approaches to solve a problem. Pretty, uh, pretty straightforward. Um, participation in problem solving increases acceptance and comprehension. So what are we talking about there? Participation in problem solving increases acceptance and comprehension. Like, what does that mean? Is that common? Is that like idea acceptance? I mean, it could be, yeah. And why does that, what's the theory behind why that takes place? Well, if you're working in a team, um, it's better, uh, it's probably better, easier to understand other points of view. Okay. Okay, all right. Yeah, Cam, okay, good, yeah. I mean, I would say if you have a CEO that's also acting as maybe like the marketing manager, um, and he's just micromanaging completely um, and not allowing the team to be able to contribute and be able to actually take time to um, come up with really viable, good ideas, um, then they're probably not gonna have a very high affinity for their own company. So I think definitely builds. So you're saying like this idea of Okay. Okay. So, I mean, it has to do with this idea that if acceptance is increasing and comprehension is increasing, the fact that I was there throughout the process of discussing whatever the issue was and what how we were going to solve it, well, that makes sense as opposed to you being um, as an individual or even as a team and someone from at the at a higher level of the organization coming down and just saying, you're going to do it this way. Well, there might have been a lot of conversations that happened at a higher level of an organization, but you weren't there. Like, you didn't experience that. You didn't have the whole, uh, you weren't privy to the whole discussion. So whenever we're talking about teams, it's an advantage because I get to be there as we're making a decision. Right? I don't know exactly how the inventory team, right, in Proclaim the Name, decided to do all the steps that they're doing. Um, but the theory would have been if you were all there and you would have come to an agreement on how best to do this, well, that could have been good and beneficial. And people would have bought into that because, well, in part, they were there for the discussion, right? They would have had their opportunity to put input uh, or for input, okay? Um, teams have been shown to um, improve customer satisfaction, okay? Um, and again, this is just more of a little bit uh, historically of some research that's, that's been done. So um, oftentimes, right, customer satisfaction is improved when the, when the company that was working on a particular problem had a team working on the job, okay? Uh, teams have been shown to improve product and service uh, quality. Um, again, kind of the same as, as the last one. Um, teams have been shown to improve product development speed and efficiency. Now, we mentioned this already, kind of, um, and I gave the caveat over time because usually it takes a little while for this to actually kick in, but it can kick in. Um, so, anyway. Um, and then teams have been shown to increase uh, employee satisfaction. I mean, generally speaking, um, when you look at the research, what companies are finding is that people do kind of enjoy the team-based concept. Um, they might not always enjoy it at first, but overwhelmingly they get there. Um, and, and as I mentioned at the onset, one of the reasons, right, is because 
sometimes our job sometimes our jobs become really mundane whenever we become so specialized and we're just doing one thing all the time over and over again. And oftentimes teams force us to be a little bit cross-functional, right? Do some different things. That's usually good for employee satisfaction. Uh, let me go back real quick to one of the things I forgot to, to mention, one of these stories. Um, a greater sum total of knowledge and, and information. And just the idea too, along with that, that one of the things about teams that, that's great is it is a benefit, right, to work with other people. So I heard a story once that's um, one of my favorites. I think it was from a pastor. But let's say you got uh, Paul and John and George. This isn't the Beatles, but this is just the names I'm using. Okay. Um, and they're all equally like best friends. Okay. Uh, and they get along great. And George dies. Well, <coughs> Paul and John, right, both think, right, that since while he was their friend and they're sad because he was deceased, they will probably become that much stronger friends, right, because George isn't around anymore. So it used to be they were equally friends. George died, which is sad. And so now Paul and John are just going to become that much closer. Does that happen? I mean, it could happen, right? But Sarah, why are you saying no? Um, I say no because I think George probably brought things to the table that like offered knowledge or skills that like brought different skill sets out of Paul or like out of John. And so like George, if this was like a great team, they worked well together, George would have enhance the team, whereas yeah. like now they're like short a person, and so now they're like, yeah, they might be best friends because they're bonding over that, but like, right. essentially they're yeah. losing something, yeah. Okay. They lost something. George brought something, right, that couldn't have been replaced in this, and, and we're talking about a, a trio of friends here. But the idea is kind of the same whenever you're talking about teams, and part of the reason we use teams in the workplace. I mean, different people bring different things. Um, you know, I've had, I've had friends in my life where, yeah, I mean, they bring out certain things in me that other friends don't, and in a good way, right, advantageously. In the same way, I mean, part of the reason we're using teams at work is because that happens in the workplace too. Now, there are boundaries to that and so on and so forth, but it's just another reason uh, that we like to use teams, not because George died or anything. Um, but you get the idea. Okay, so some disadvantages. So let's scroll back down here. <coughs> um, often teams are associated with high turnover. Uh, so this sounds counter to the other stuff I was saying, or contrary to the other stuff I was saying. Um, and I'll put a caveat on this too. You usually see the high turnover more when teams are introduced to a workplace. So why might that be? Yeah, Nicole. Because they don't like change. Well, it could be. It's a new thing, uh, especially when you're talking about the introduction or uh, of, of teams into a workplace where maybe a team concept wasn't the, prim wasn't the primary focus. That's a possibility. Yeah. What else? Yeah, Clayton. Well, some people just prefer to work alone. So if they've been working alone, and then suddenly they're in a team, they no longer yeah, find people. this to be a good place to work. OK. Yeah, some people prefer. I mean, you know, they, they feel like they work better alone. Um, why else? I think that's accurate. Yeah, Colin. I think a lot of companies are starting to put teams together that kind of don't need to be together. And I think people get frustrated. Like, I'm the type of person, like, I know, mm -hmm. like, if I recognize that in a workplace, like, I don't want to be there. Like, they start kind of, like, dividing one person's work into Yeah. Personality types okay. Okay. Sarah, what were you going to say? Um, I was just going to say, like, initially, I don't know how they would be, like, forming these teams, but they might, you know, as, as time goes on, see that this person is fit somewhere else. So I don't know if, like, the turnover means that they leave, like, the company altogether, but maybe because they move to a different group, yeah. they can think about that. 
Well, it could be. I mean, it, it could be. It's usually leaving the company, but um, no, all all accurate. And Connor, I think I think you're probably right. I think the idea of using teams has become so prevalent that it's just become a default for a lot of companies. Oh, let's put a team together to do that, and they haven't actually thought of okay, why in the world are we actually using a team? And in this particular situation, do we actually need a team? Or are we just going to put it together because that's what we're supposed to do? Um, so absolutely. And, and sometimes, like, listen, whenever you put teams together for the wrong reasons and there starts to be dysfunction in the team, well, all of a sudden, that, that's not helpful, right? So it could be an individual preference. I just prefer to be working alone. It could be that teams are put together for the wrong reasons. And so therefore, they go into a dysfunctional state, and that's what leads to the turnover. So it could be um, all of these things, right? But it does happen, and it usually happens at the onset. Uh, teams are also associated with social loafing. So what's social loafing? Now, <laughs> let's be clear. No one in this class has ever socially been a loafer. I know that for sure. But but you might know what it is. You might know what it is. What, what is it? What are we talking about? <laughs> yeah, Josh. Just like generally slacking off. Well, it kind of slacking off. Why? Because other people are going to pick up the slack. They'll do it for me. You know. Um, so that's why I said none of you have ever done that, and I understand this. Um, but you might have experienced this in some other way, um, and I'm sure in the nature of all your uh, academic experiences, you at some point in time have been put into a group and you didn't feel like someone was doing what they should. Yeah, Cam. Yeah, would you say none of this would take place if there is originally a good mission and individual goals for each person, or is this just a result? Oh, uh, no, I think it could still take place. I mean, you know, I, I think I think there's a better chance of it not happening whenever teams are really put together for the right reasons and stuff like that. Um, but I think it could still happen. You know, I had a student once tell me that you know they were in they were part of a group, um, and they said something to the effect of they weren't happy with the way their group was going for a group project. And I'm not saying that this is a great. We'll come back to this in some ways, but. She, said, she made a comment to the effect of, well, this would never happen in the real world because someone could get fired. And I was like, oh, it happens in the real world all the time, right? <laughs> I mean, so it still happens. Um, but if teams aren't put together for the right reasons and they aren't managed, eh, you know, I, th I think you still maybe have that chance. But anyway, um, yeah, you have uh, experienced this. There's also these couple of things. Um, one's called groupthink, and, and another one I mentioned is called the Abilene Paradox. Okay, so what is groupthink? When you think about, so groupthink was mentioned in this chapter, but it was also mentioned previously in your textbook, like an early chapter. But what what is groupthink? Yeah, Nicole. Uh, kind of, yeah. Um, so at the end of the day, right, the group of people, team in this case, since we're talking about here, they all end up making the same decision. But oftentimes in groupthink, there's some small part of the group or team that's very, very persuasive, almost sometimes in a combative way. Oftentimes it comes out in a combative way where they get everyone to go along with them. Now. The combativeness doesn't always have to be there, but oftentimes it is. Like, probably the most famous example, um, you know, the, the, the Challenger, the space shuttle Challenger that exploded. So there's a, a, a whole story behind that, which is the decision was, should we fly this space shuttle on this particular day or not based on the overnight temperature? And there are certain components right in the space shuttle that um, had never been tested at certain temperatures. And overwhelmingly what that meant was the overnight temperature in Florida got really, really low. And what did that mean for these certain components in the space shuttle? Okay. Well, there's a whole case about the discussions that happened leading up to the decision to actually fly the space shuttle. Um, 
and famously, a couple of the engineers who later on in life said they didn't push hard enough to actually ground the shuttle, um, you know, talked about the fact they had real regrets because there was this other group who was really pushing, really influential on pushing the group into making a decision to fly the shuttle, essentially. Um, and so in that way, there was a kind of a, a, a very influential borderline combative force that got everyone to move in the same direction. And that can happen, right, in, that's a downside of potentiality of, of groupthink. Another one is the Abilene Paradox, which is a little bit different. So I always read this little short story here because it's what the Abilene Paradox is based on. Um, so <coughs> the July afternoon in Coleman, Texas was particularly hot, 104 degrees. Uh, in addition, the wind was blowing fine grain West Texas topsoil through the house. But the afternoon was still tolerable and potentially enjoyable. There was a fan going on in the back porch, there was a cold lemonade, and finally there was entertainment with the family, dominoes. Okay. So perfect for the conditions. The game required little more physical exertion than an occasional mumbled comment, shuffle them, and an unhurried movement to the arm, uh, of the arm to the place uh, to <laughs> to the place the spots in the appropriate perspective on the table. All in all, it had the makings of an agreeable Sunday afternoon in Coleman. That is, that is until my father-in-law suddenly said, let's get in the car and go to Abilene and have dinner at the cafeteria. Um, I guess the cafeteria is just the name of the restaurant. Anyway, I thought, why go to Abilene? 53 miles in this dust storm and heat. It's an unair conditioned car, but my wife chimed in, sounds like a great idea, I'd like to go. How about you, Jerry? Since my own preferences were obviously out of step with the rest, I replied, sounds good to me. And he added, I just hope, um, and added, I just hope your mother wants to go. Of course I wanna go, said my mother-in-law. I haven't been to Abilene in years. So into the car and off to Abilene we went. My predictions were fulfilled. The heat was brutal. We were coated with a fine layer of dust that was cemented with perspiration by the time we arrived. The food at the cafeteria provided first-rate uh, <laughs> testimonial material for antacid commercials. Some, for, uh, some four hours and 106 miles later, we returned to Coleman hot and exhausted. We sat in front of a fan for a long time in silence. Then both to be uh, sociable and to break the silence, I said, it was a great trip, wasn't it? No one spoke. Finally, my mother-in-law said with some irritation, well, to tell you the truth, I really didn't enjoy it much and would have rather stayed here. Just went along because the th I just went along because the three of you were so enthusiastic about going. I wouldn't have gone at all if you hadn't pressured me into it. I couldn't believe it. What do you mean, y'all, I said. Don't put me in the y'all group. I was delighted to be going. Um, I was delighted to be doing what you were doing. I didn't want to go. I only want to satisfy the rest of you. My wife looked shocked. Don't call me a culprit. You and dad and mom were the ones who wanted to go. I just went along to be sociable and keep you happy. And would have been crazy. I would have <laughs> been crazy to want to go out in heat like that. The father had entered, the father entered the conversation abruptly. Uh, he proceeded to explain uh, about what was already absolutely clear. Listen, I never really wanted to go to Abilene either. I just thought you might be bored. You visit so seldom, I wanted to make sure you enjoyed it. I would have preferred you to play another game of dominoes and eat leftovers in the fridge. So, the Abilene paradox is, right, a little bit different than groupthink because we all just go along in the wrong direction. And no one ever actually says anything about the idea, right? So. Have you ever been a part of this? Where a group that you're part of, maybe a team, you just all go the wrong way. And no one ever really speaks up and says anything to differ. And at the end of it, you all realize that no one really wanted to do the thing you were doing. And it would have been a lot better if someone would have just would have spoke up and prevented you from traveling 104 miles in Texas in the middle of the summer. Anyone experience this? Yeah, Connor. <laughs>
Yeah. Kind of that shot me on. Okay. But no one spoke up throughout the whole process. Well, we were, it was like a PowerPoint, and we all did our parts of it. And so yeah. we're kind of afraid to say, like, I don't like that slide, you know, yeah. that someone spent a couple hours on. Yeah. But this guy came in, and he's just like, yeah, yeah, it's got to go. Right. Yeah. It happens all the time, right? Shockingly amount. You know, because what are we doing? Well, we're trying to be nice. You know, we don't want to be a person who says, oh, I don't want to go. Like, you know, who wants to be a person that says they don't want to go to Abilene? I mean, I've been on groups like this. I'm like, yeah, yeah, sure, let's just go with that. And it ends up being terrible, like, choice. Um, and so it's just another right, downside. It's a potential disadvantage. So it's a little bit different than groupthink. The end result is the same, which is everyone in the group is going the same direction. It's just that the way you get there is slightly different. Um, so pay attention to that because my experience has told me if I've been in a group and I'm not saying anything, other people in the group are probably thinking something similar. Um, and so we're just all not saying anything uh, together. OK, uh, a couple factors that can be assets or liabilities when using teams. Well, first of all, all the advantages of teams, we only get the advantages of like you know, bringing a diverse, diverse group of people together and becoming more efficient if the team is actually getting along. If there's disagreement within the team, all that stuff that the team was supposed to be formed for, it can kind of go away. Um, there can be conflicting interests versus mutual interests. Um, we might have different tolerances for risk taking. Um, also, time requirements can be a little bit different. And so you may or may not get the benefit. Um, so for instance, let's say you have a project where it's really, really important that it be done fast. Okay. Um, well, it might not be a time to use a team because teams kind of work slower. Um, and so we just have to be aware of, of that. So if there's a time requirement, it might not be a time to use a team. But we do use teams when the work demands people working together and that resources exist. So the resources existing part is important because we know things with teams might actually get off to a slow start. Right? There could be turnover. Right? So the resource of do we have time to do it? Do we have the money to um, you know, take that hit of turnover initially if we're trying to move to a team-based project. So do we have the demand of needing to work together, like it's not something that can be done individually, and do the resources exist to actually make it happen? And we also use teams when rewards exist for the team, performance, and teamwork. So usually, you know, in the context of workplaces, there's going to be some level, right, of individual performance evaluation. But if you're going to do a team-based anything, you better have team-based um, rewards, right, not just individual rewards. Because if you put everyone as a part of a team and you have individual rewards, well, what happens? People start to worry about their individual rewards and they start to forget about the fact they're on a team and the team is supposed to be accomplishing something. So they're better at minimum be also right, team-based rewards, if not completely team-based rewards. Right? That that's another option. All right, another thing that's important with teams is the level of autonomy. OK, so the book kind of goes through this. Um, and you can kind of, this is from your, your text, right? So traditional work groups, um, they just execute a task. All right, so that they are managed by someone else, right, in the context of that workplace structure. There's like, hey, we have a task to do. Let's put together a, a team. And it really should be called a work group. Um, because all you're going to do is just perform some tasks. So, um, well, let me go through the rest real quick, and then I'll ask for an example. So employee involvement in groups, like they're put together. Um, yeah, they might execute a task, but they also might give suggestions to management. So I think about this in higher ed a lot because we love to use committees, right? And so sometimes we put together p committees just to make some recommendation, right, to, um, some so to an administrator. Um, Semi-autonomous work groups, um, they can make decisions, they can solve problems. Um, but usually for like the major production or um, the, the, the major production of a particular task, self-managing teams, 
they can make decisions and they can solve problems all the way down to the minutia of how something is done. So um, slight differential there. And then self-designing teams, um, they actually have the ability to leverage who's on the team, uh, what they're actually going to accomplish, um, and they are truly autonomous. That is pretty rare to come by, to be honest with you, in the workplace. There are, there are companies who are trying this. They're essentially saying, we don't have any management at this workplace. Like, we put ourselves in teams, we get things done in teams, uh, teams decide who comes into the workplace, et cetera, et cetera. We might have a CEO, but even the CEO is saying we're not going to have, we're not going to look in any way, shape, or form like a manager. So it's pretty, uh, it's pretty difficult to come by. But let me ask you this question. Uh, so you've been put on a lot of uh, teams just to do uh, group work in school, like in whatever class. Where does that fall in this category? from an autonomy standpoint. So I did it in this class, right? I say, hey, there's groups of, of three, All right? You're gonna do this short presentation. Where does that fall? Yeah. Would that just be the traditional work group? It's just a work group, you know? Um, because all I'm doing, like, I didn't even let you pick your own groups. That was bad. Like, you know, I just let Candace do it. Um, so I'm just saying, here's the bounds of the, of the project, right, this presentation. Um, here's what group you're on. You just have to do that. I mean, I'll be honest. In the context of workplace teams, it's not the great use of a team. Like, all I'm really doing is giving you an opportunity to share the workload of going through a book, right? I mean, that's really what's happening at the end of the day. Um, so yeah, I mean, most of the stuff you do in the context of education is just like kind of a traditional work group. Now what about the, what about NEOs? What happened there? Where does that fit? Where does that fit? Yeah, Carl. Okay. Okay. What else? Anyone else have any thoughts? Where do you fit into this? I think an argument could be made about that. You know, I mean, the membership is a huge thing, right? Um, who's actually going to be on the teams? Um, yeah, Dr. Guernsey and I, we try to stay out of your way, right? Um, you know, you had a major production, right? The major production was we're going to sell the stuff, right? The individual individuality, right, in, in terms of the smaller decisions, you did all that too. I mean, you decided, right, how you were going to. You decided how you are going to market it. Uh, we never really told you how. We, you know, maybe Dr. Austin guided you through a process by which you could gain your own information about how you could best do that and which products would be best you know, put together. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, you kind of, kind of broke into your own group in some ways. Um, I mean, the only part where it wouldn't be a self-designing team maybe is, you know, you were all still in the context of a classroom, right? Um, but membership was consistent. So yeah, I mean, you definitely have an experience here that is a bit more on the side of high autonomy than it is low uh, autonomy. I mean, maybe more so than what you might experience when you go into the workplace. Because I think a lot of the workplaces, right, they probably end up falling in the middle somewhere. Um, and maybe even less autonomous, right? Because managers get a little uncomfortable about the idea of using teams and giving up control, as we well know. So anyway, the autonomy um, that you give teams, it's important. Do you think there's a better way? I mean, do you think one option is better than another? Yeah. I think it's like a bank book. Sure. Like the scenario. 
Okay. Yeah, I think so. I think overall, Clayton, go ahead. I, I think it's a little bit better to have more um, autonomy mm -hmm. in the sense that the team can take a little bit more ownership mm -hmm. on their tasks okay. um, and be more motivated to complete them. Okay. I mean, I agree with both from this perspective. If and, and what my role as a manager is, is to understand what I'm asking of the team and what kind of autonomy I'm putting on them and to be clear about it when we start. Like, hey, listen, I just need you four people or whatever the case may be um, to work on this one, this one task, this project, and get this done. I mean, Connor, that's kind of like what you experience with a project. Um, and that can be okay um, as long as we're all clear about it. But if you start dictating how they make decisions, right, and dictate the specific nature of the task they do within that team, well, then we'd probably like to have them be a little bit more autonomous, right, because that's going to be better buy-in. We're going to like that a little bit better. Okay. Uh, some team characteristics. Um, team norms are informally agreed upon standards that must regulate behavior. We're going to move, so we're going to come back to this real quick. Um, some other team characteristics that become important. Um, the size of teams can have an impact on the overall effectiveness. Um, listen, there's not a perfect number for, the, for team size. But overwhelmingly, the research says that um, productivity in teams kind of starts to level off once we get around the four to five people area. It's not to say that six or seven people couldn't work, but when we get into four or five, we see that product sometimes productivity starts to level off. We kind of maybe in some ways have maximized our efficiency in that particular team. A lot of the research kind of points you to eh, four or five. So um, conflict in teams will happen. Cognitive conflict can enhance performance. Like Connor's example is a good one. It would have been great if that person would have been on the team right the whole time so they could have chimed in and recorrected right in a constructive way. Um, it's just that that constructive um, feedback didn't happen until the end, right? So they had to go back and start over. But if that kind of constructive feedback were happening, um, that would have been um, the kind of conflict that can enhance performance. And then lastly, one of the things that, that's studied a lot is actually this idea of cohesion, right? So cohesion is consistently a key predictor of teams reaching potential. Um, and so in the context of sports, it's used uh, a lot, right? The cohesion. How cohesive was this group? What is that? What do you think that means? What do you think cohesion means? Yeah, Clayton. Like how close they are or how well they work together. Okay, how well they work together. How close they are, maybe. So, like, we all see these workplaces that, you know, kind of are, are gain some notoriety because they like have ping pong tables and foosball tables and stuff like that. I mean, why do they actually, why do workplaces actually do that? Yeah, Jake. Okay. Well, that's the idea, right? I mean, at least socially, what were you going to say, Luke? How is it different or how is it mentioned throughout the work culture? I think okay. Sure, they're definitely, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so cohesion, one way I like to think about it is like, it's like this glue thing that holds the team together, right? And there can be task cohesion, there can be social cohesion. So whenever we do things like, hey, let's go do something fun together, that's, that's leaning toward a socially cohesive group. Now you can have socially cohesive groups, and they might not necessarily be cohesed on the task. Right? And you can have vice versa. We want groups to be cohesive like for both. Right? That's ultimately a thing that gets us going in the right direction and gets us performing to potential. So whenever we talk about it in sports teams, just because we have a team that's high in cohesion doesn't mean they win all their games. But it can mean that they're closer to maximizing their potential, even if it doesn't mean they win all the time. Okay. Um, Two more things real quick. Uh, we're going to come back to this actually in our, we're going to revisit this a lot in our last case uh, because it's really a team kind of thing. But we all, like every team you've ever been on, whether you knew it or not, I mean, you went through some stages of development, right? 
So you had a forming stage where you were just kind of getting to know one another. Everyone was kind of nice. Like things were going well. I mean, hey, that's all great. Okay, you guys went through this, whether you knew it or not, with um, with Neos. Um, you went through a storming phase, likely, uh, where, hey, now that we're all done being nice, let's actually talk about something. Like, let's start moving forward. Let's hash this out. Which products are we actually going to sell? Why are we actually going to sell that? Is that a good idea? And then maybe you start to get some opinions, right? And it doesn't have to be all negative, but you have to work through right, some of that. And then you actually get into a norming phase where you kind of know what to expect from other people and you can kind of move forward potentially into performing. Now this can take a long time. Um, I mean, just to kind of cut to the chase with you guys, you all are probably going back and forth between these two things still, right? Um, now you might, a lot of times I ask Neos groups, hey, where do you think you are? And a lot of times they say, oh, we're performing. And I would say, no, you're probably not because you just haven't been together long enough doing a task um, enough. So for instance, this is all the first time right, that you're venturing into selling things in the groups that you have. Um, you would have to go through that maybe another time or two more times right, to really get into a, uh, a sense of performing. Like doing what I used to do with event management. We would consistently try to bring the same people into our events from outside because when we were doing 20 events per year, um, we really went through this. And we, by the end of the event season, we could see that people were really, really working together well because we had done, it, we had done many events together. Um, and so you almost have to go through the whole process, right? Um, multiple times to really get to this idea of performing. But it's just, it's just kind of a sense of, to give you a sense of kind of where you are. And if it's not managed well, right, you can slip into the other side of, of the team development and go the opposite direction and it's no good. But it can happen. Um, so again, we're going to, we're going to revisit this a bit more in our last case for sure. Uh, let me just skip to the last thing. So one of my favorite examples real quick is from a company called Cessna. And so anyone know what Cessna does? They build airplanes. So anyway, it's a, okay. <laughs> so uh, Cessna builds airplanes, right? How do you think you would put an airplane together? How do you think that would happen? I mean, we, we talked about it last time, last class. How, how do you think you would put it? Assembly line. Assembly line, right? Specialized. You, you do this very, very specific thing. You put a door on all day, every day. That's what you do. Well, Cessna decided um, it's probably maybe 10 or 12 years ago, they were going to really do something radical. And the reason I like this example is because it shows you what teams can be right, in a context that I wouldn't have thought of. Right? I would never think of putting the plane together um, any way but an assembly line, but like you would do with a car. Right? But they decided that they were going to use a team approach to literally put their planes together. And so what did that mean? Well, they put people together from different functional areas they brought them together on a team, and they literally put all the components that they would need to put together a plane, like in the middle of the room, right? And they said, build the plane, right? Here's your team, build the plane. And so what happened was, uh, first of all, um, they built a lot less planes at first. Um, it was about a three-year process by which their productivity went down, People were leaving, like it wasn't going great. But at the end of that three years, they figured out a couple of things. One, they had figured out, you know, because of the nature of the teams they put together, they figured out that they could actually build more planes because the people on the teams actually started to find new ways to do things, right? And then one team, you know, I mean the teams, because uh, there's many, many teams kind of all at the same project, they would start to share ideas, right? And they would figure out better ways to put this thing, put this plane together. And so the quality of construction went up. They started putting together more planes. They actually used a ton less warehouse space, right? Because assembly lines take up a lot of space. But whenever everything is just kind of centralized and you're all working around 
right? Um, all these pieces of a plane. Well, that looks different. It doesn't take up as much space. So they created an efficiency that they wouldn't. They weren't even exactly sure that was going to happen, um, and they just put planes together better. Um, and so I would have never, right, thought of doing something that transformational, like in an organization. But it can. Right, you can even do uh, a team-based concept with something like that. Okay, we're done because it's time to go. <laughs>